famous designer Karl Lagerfeld has conquered not only the world of fashion, but also the worlds of high society and politics. Admired and talented musician of form and beauty, he has become the king of international fashion. King Karl, he is called. His parties, such as this one given at Versailles for his birthday, are the toast of the town. His clients, Princess Caroline of Monaco, Mrs. Mitterrand, Jack Lang, the French Minister of Culture, Catherine Deneuve, are also his friends. Karl Lagerfeld did not choose the former royal palace of the kings of France for his party just by chance. He is a great lover of the 18th century. His own homes are filled with similar grandeur. In his townhouse, dating from the time of Louis XIV, he has recreated an atmosphere worthy of Versailles, and the famous hair ribbon he wears proudly is a nod to the century of Mozart. Karl's talent is to observe women and to foresee what they will want to wear the coming season. That gives him an edge over his competitors. Just like the legendary Coco Chanel whose company and even office he has taken over, he knows how to update a style by putting old elements together in new ways. A chameleon, he moves easily in many circles, designing 10 international collections per year. Though born in Hamburg, Germany, he is above all a European. Houses are his passion, and he's forever collecting and redecorating them. At the height of his glory, Karl Lagerfeld is surrounded by luxury. He owns several Bentleys and often travels in a private airplane. Famous as far as Tokyo and Hong Kong, he is, after shows, applauded and received like an emperor. A man of fashion, he is also a man of culture. An art connoisseur, he has gathered a collection of priceless treasures. He has managed to make a fortune while remaining independent from the fashion houses he works for. Rich and famous, he preciously guards this freedom. There are those who are jealous, envious, but Karl Lagerfeld can count on his solid friendships, such as with Princess Caroline of Monaco, who is one of his closest friends. You know, I live in Monte Carlo, so uh, if you live in Monte Carlo, the only really nice people over there they are, uh, are the royal family over there. They are the, the brightest family over there, and they make that Monte Carlo is a pleasant place to live. And today, do you have a busy social life? No, I'm not very social because I'm too busy to be social, and I have no social ambition, because social ambitions are not something of our day that doesn't say anything anymore. So. I have a, for what I consider a very pleasant life, perhaps a little too busy, but I like that too because for me daydreaming and doing nothing is a luxury. If you don't have a busy life, it's boredom. Karl Lagerfeld has proved it's possible to be an artist and a shrewd businessman at the same time. It's a talent that's appreciated by Klaus Stahlmann, president of Europe's largest ready-to-wear company, for whom Carl designs. We have found that we are working together with a man who is uh, very creative, who knows the lifestyle feeling of people, and he reacts accordingly. And he is also prepared to discuss certain amendments which we have made from a marketing point of view which is very rare because you, you hardly find uh, high-ranking designers who are interested in marketing. They are mainly interested in uh, showing their name and creating some sort of fashion. But marketing for them is, is a wrong word. They don't understand it, and Carl understands it. The results are that we, are, we have planned for the first year 20 million turnover, and we reached 30, so we reached more than we had planned which is fantastic. I think uh, the most important uh, thing about the uh, cooperation we have with Karl Lagerfeld is that Mr. Lagerfeld is not only creative, but he looks at the people, at the development of people, at, at the lifestyle development of people, which is very important because, you know, we are living in a world where the fashion is uh, not, cannot be dictated. You have to follow the way of life of people. And if you look at the developments of our society during the last 30 years, we have had so many changes. Uh, if you do not recognize the changes, then you may produce something which is not accepted. And Karl Lagerfeld has this feeling. 
you can say that uh, the success of German stylists uh, worldwide uh, is uh, has been not has not been there. Karl Lagerfeld is the only one who got international rec recognition. It's very typical uh, landmark uh, thing for Hamburg, the, the kappa roof with uh, those strange stones. There's something very magic about the harbor of Hamburg. I went there already as a child, huh? so because I, I knew people who had uh, school friends and people like this who had parents who were in shipping and this kind of business, you see, so we went to visit the ships and things like that. Today, Karl has decided to go back to his roots in Germany. Karl's father was a wealthy Swiss industrialist who settled in Hamburg in the 1920s. Karl, of course, could have chosen a less risky field than fashion. Here he's visiting his new home with his architect and decorators. From the porch, he enjoys the same view of the Elbe River he had as a child. It's identical, it's exactly the same room. And uh, the noises I remember first are the same noises I still hear today. What kind of atmosphere are you going to create in this house? An atmosphere uh, in the spirit of the Weimar Republic uh, and uh, also in the style of the school of Darmstadt. Is it true that you can only sleep on canopy beds? <laughs> then I, I slept very well tonight in my hotel bed here in Hamburg and there is no canopy. I can sleep wherever I want, I even in my car, in an airplane and in a train, so I have not this kind of problem. Thank God, imagine that today. Do you plan to spend your weekends here? You know, my, part, my life is not in uh, weeks and weekends. I come here when I can come. I work on Sundays, I work on Saturdays, sometimes I don't work in the middle of the week. My life is not uh, uh, like this, weeks and weeks end. It's always weekend, it's always weekend. I think the best inheritance of my parents is not the money they left me, but the freedom to do when I wanted to do things when I was very young and where people normally are not supposed to do what they want, may, but to go to school. I could do when I wanted what I wanted. I think there's nothing better in the world. And they always said, if it's not working out, you come back to school, do what you want, but it has to be a success. When I was a child, I wanted to also to learn the piano. I was not very gifted. After one year, my mother stopped the lesson and she said, draw, it makes less noise, and she had a good idea. At 15, Carl left for Paris to study. Not overly studious, he spent his time in post-war Saint-Germain, stomping ground of Vadim, Simone de Beauvoir, Jean-Paul Sartre, Juliet Grecker, and the poet-illustrator Jean Cocteau. beginning I wanted to become an illustrator, then I wanted to become a painter. Uh, I really didn't know exactly how I could do what in a way I wanted to do. Fashion is something I always was interested in, but it interested me already before I even knew that it was called fashion, you know. I was interested in, in what I saw on paintings, and I still am. Look around here, all the uh, beautiful costume of all the people on the painting on the wall, and uh, also the people around me, and in history of costume and languages. With a gift for drawing, Carl since childhood has had a passion for the history of costumes. He would amuse himself by reinterpreting the styles of various periods. When I look at a painting, he says, the first thing I see is the costumes. At 16, aware of his talent, he entered his drawings in a design contest. I saw huge posters uh, designed by Gruyot all over Paris. And those posters said, send a sketch, if you are an amateur, uh, not a professional fashion designer, with something, all coat or dress, and it had to be in wool, because this was organized by the International Wool Fashion Office. And I sent some sketches. And six months later, and I had forgotten everything about those sketches, uh, I got a telegram telling me that I had got the first prize for a coat. And that is, in a way, or everything started. Pierre Balmain, then one of Paris's most prestigious designers, immediately hired the talented young man. You know, I was assistant in the studio. And uh, in those days, it was quite a lot of work because they had many buyers. 
and uh, I designed for the boutique and things like that. No, it was a very easy work relationship, and I spent three and a half years there. In fact, backstage, behind the doors of the salon, it was quite horrible, quite sordid, and people were quite mean. Because in those years, the people in fashion had still big social complexes. So what they did, they wanted the other to who were under their orders to pay for their social complexes. You know, that was very stupid like this. And it was, in fact, quite a vulgar atmosphere. The models were still like in the cheap novels of kept women and things like this. Huh? Carl still has many of the friends he made then. And a good number of those who worked at Balma still work with him today. In everyone's opinion, Carl was extremely gifted and destined for a brilliant future. I remember when I got married, in fact, a little before, Carl had made a very, very beautiful sketch, a beautiful drawing of a woman from 1830, sitting nonchalantly all covered in satin. I loved that drawing, and one day he told me, I'm giving you this sketch, it's a wedding present. And he told me, be sure to hang on to it, one day I'll be famous. After three years at Balma, in 1958, he was hired by another famous fashion house, Jean Patou. Here he developed and refined his style. In those years, there was very little to do. I had two collections a year of 60 dresses. They made no ready to wear, they made nothing else. So, in fact, I was underemployed. I had plenty of free time, much more than a young man really needs. One should work perhaps more, but my contract didn't allow me to work on other things, and I felt no need to do it then, because the craze was ready to wear and all that started later. In those years, I thought it was pleasant. I was not overly ambitious, and uh, I had a very pleasant, spoiled life. In fact, I'm a former spoiled child. And my main ambition was to have a new beautiful car every year. It was very stupid, but I mean, it's okay if you're 20. In the late 50s and early 60s, the French economy was booming, and Karl Lagerfeld, already well-known and respected, was busy and earning a lot of money. Becoming something of a playboy, he ran with the jet set and went to fashionable resorts like Saint-Tropez, where he indulged in a playfulness he still exhibits today. This was the period of high fashion in France. The likes of Givenchy, Jacques Fath, Chanel, Balenciaga, and Christian Dior dictated what length dresses would be and the look of high society women. They were demigods who lived in a rather old style world and who designed solely for the elite, a group from which Karl kept a certain distance and reserve. the way it was then bored me to death it was not stimulating as I thought it was perhaps before but it was not then anymore so I started freelance designing in France and in Italy in the same time in the middle 60s and finally all, everything worked out well and I found it was amusing to have a job nobody else had done that way before because before people used to work for one company and that it was and nobody ever made a name by working for a ready-to-wear company because there were no ready-to-wear companies with a real name before. And that was exciting, new and right for that period. In the early 60s, the idea of ready-to-wear was born, a sort of simplified high fashion which anyone could wear. Carl jumped on the bandwagon and offered his talents to several houses. His goal? to design clothes aimed at various audiences. He joined Chloe, where his success was immediate. He created a new style, a feminine Parisian look, destructured and soft, which corresponded perfectly to the time. Only the hats kept the sophistication of high fashion as a nod of respect for the past. The young man hit his stride 
and affirmed his own style. And this included his trademark fans. Touted as one of the most talented designers in the French capital, Carl was nicknamed KL, or King Carl. He cultivated a rather extravagant look. In 1963, Carl met the woman who were to play an enormous role in his life and his career, the Fendi sisters. The five Roman women, queens of top quality fashion furs, asked him to design their collections. Little by little, they have become his second family. Several times a year, Carl comes to work with them in Rome. We have well-known clients from all over the world, from actresses to nobles. I must say, there's a long list of names that have been important to Fendi all these years. Catherine Deneuve, among the actresses, she's an admirer of Fendi who's very faithful to us and many other actresses as well. Uh, Ira Furstenberg, Grace Jones. We really value these important women from all over the world who love Fendi and who wear it with great class. In Rome, the windows of the Fendi boutiques offer the most beautiful and luxurious things dreams are made of. Furs, evening gowns, luggage, handbags, belts, and a multitude of other objects which in fashion jargon are called licenses. Carl Lagerfeld designs our entire line. It's a pleasure to work with Carl because there's a lot of feeling between us. It's been years now. We practically grew up together, and so we understand immediately his message. And it's wonderful, because we manage to pass it directly on to our public, our clientele. Carl's fur collections for Fendi have been successful for over 25 years. The five sisters have also asked him to design a high fashion and ready-to-wear line. These have been just as successful. The Fendi sisters, we work together now for 25 years, 26 years. So they are like, I wouldn't say like my sisters, because I don't have a very strong family sense, because I have not really any family left. But, you know, I can hardly match my professional and even my private life without them, because they are really part of the life. During each of his trips to Rome, Carl is welcomed like a member of the family into one or the other of the Fendi sisters' homes. We meet with Carl about every two weeks. What's extraordinary is that he, he comes to Rome he works here, where he passes on the Fendi spirit, and while working, he immerses himself in the city. For us, these are very important meetings. In my work, for example, I am always regenerated. It's a breath of, of fresh air, and it gives me an enormous amount of energy for the whole creative aspect. I feel the need to the need to see him, and if more than two weeks go by, I realize it's absolutely crucial. We ask him to do as much as possible with us, because we have total, blind faith in him. Uh, he's a master. So, when he comes to Rome, we concentrate. We work intensively with him. And, and during the time he's with us, we try to pull out and absorb as much as possible in every area, in every sense. How do you explain Karl Lagerfeld's success? First and foremost, 
by his talent, then by his culture, and also some people are just born exceptional. A musician, for example, and he was definitely born with something more than the common mortal. The Chanel workshops are located near the Place Vendôme in Paris. Karl Lagerfeld was given the artistic direction of Chanel in 1983, at a time when Chanel's name had been largely forgotten, remembered only for its perfumes and its reputation. He brought new life back into the shops, where the most expert hands of Paris measure, cut, drape, sew, and embroider the most beautiful, the most durable, and the most expensive garments in the world. hated the most, the knee, and it was a smash. In 1987, Carl received the French fashion industry's highest award for the best collection of the year. In 1980, Carl has enjoyed international stature, and success means traveling a lot. Everywhere he goes, he takes his famous notebook with him, a sort of album, where he notes down his thoughts or pastes in the things that interest him. I did it for years, then I stopped it, then I did it again, but as I write it in German, very few people can read it, in a kind of strange uh, personal, shorthand, and German. So even the people who work in my house cannot read it, uh, except me. I, nobody can read it. And sometimes when I see the page I had written 10 years ago, I have trouble myself reading it again. Huh? This is a kind of, I don't want to say diary. It's at the same time an address book, a journal of ideas. There's a little of everything here. My hotel in Japan when I was there a while back. This is the way the worksite looked. Here's a story I wrote for television. It's the history of fashion from 1900 to today, the evolution of the feminine form. These are more stories, addresses, logos, cutouts, and this I find very funny, the ponytail. These, you see, are all kinds of friends, purchases, a little of everything. 
In 1984, Carl started off on a new adventure, the creation of his own ready-to-wear company, Carl Lagerfeld. For the first time, the clothes he designed carried his own name. The company is today part of the Revillon Group and is headed by Ralph Toledano. The Carl Lagerfeld activity is based on, I would say, three main uh, directions. The first one is the couture ready-to-wear, which we manufacture, sell, promote by ourselves. It's a business totally controlled. Second is distribution. We have uh, one own boutique in the Football saint Honoré and around 10 freestanding boutiques, basically in Europe and Far East. And the third aspect is the diversification, which is made basically at a licensing deal, worldwide licensing deal. Who are your American partners? It's the main partners are uh, groups like uh, Neiman's, uh, Bergdorf Goodman, uh, Saks Fifth Avenue, I Magnin. This company uh, is his company. Uh, it's the Carl Gaffel House, and still, uh, Carl leaves me to totally free to make the decision I feel convenient for the company. Of course, he knows that I will never hide anything to him. He knows exactly what's happening. But he, he does not interfere. He won't tell me do that rather than doing something else. He's very, very open. If this dimension you must have in mind when you want to understand Carl. I think that Carl's know much more about uh, the, the kind of garments or the kind of music or the kind of culture uh, of my daughter than I do. And my daughter is 12 years old. He doesn't 100%. Around 20 collections per year. And once I have uh, calculated that at an average, once per month, Carl is going out on the runway. And when you know the pressure it is to show a collection on the runway uh, to uh, hundreds, or sometimes uh, thousands of people, uh, you can see uh, the kind of man he is. Even on the eve of an important fashion show, Carl is calm and keeps his sense of humor. Amidst the energy buzzing all around him, he remains charming and witty, choosing the hairstyles for the show with the famous hairstylist, Alexandra. Who are they from? Look more like vegetables than anything else. Anyway, they're beautiful. Give them to me a second. These go divinely with your colors. Here you go. In the 70s, to build a successful fashion house, a talent, a big talent, maybe was enough. In the 80s, a very big talent still, but also a very good management. In the 90s, we need a talent, the very big talent, the management, the team, and money. The enterprise, in this industry has become uh, very, very high, at least for us. Uh, it's several million dollars. And from a certain point of view, it's quite, quite positive because uh, it helps to go much quicker. It helps to diversify into new fields. But also, it must be based on very clear, uh, I would say, consideration. First is that you look for long-term and not for short money. Second, as I said before, mutual respect. And third, that the fashion company must retain his uh, autonomy and not suffer of uh, heavy structures. Twice a year, an immense tent is set up near the Pyramid of the Louvre in Paris, where the magical rite takes place the presentation of the summer and winter fashion collections. Carl has shows for both Chanel and his KL line. 
fashion journalists and the most important buyers of the world will gather in this great room and seating them is no easy task. Each one is assigned a certain seat in a certain row according to his or her importance in the fashion.